Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the NAACP Arlington Branches Housing Equity Best Practices discussion with Demetria McCain, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity at the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. My name is Kellen Macbeth, and I am an at-large member of the Executive Committee for the branch, as well as the former chair of the Housing Committee. I'd like to thank our branch president, Michael Heminger, Secretary Wanda Younger, Housing Committee Chair Wells Harrell, and Communications Committee Chair uh, Leah Matterall for their help putting this event together. I would also like to thank HUD for their support um, as well. Today, we're having a discussion with Demetria about fair housing and housing equity, just in time for Fair Housing Month. So happy Fair Housing Month, everyone. Uh, Demetria is going to open with some remarks, um, followed by a discussion with her and I. Um, we're going to wrap it up uh, close to the end of the hour um, with probably time for maybe a question or two um, from audience members. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please put it in the chat, um, but remain on mute during the uh, event. I'll be monitoring the chat um, and I will select questions for Demetria from there. Um, I'd like to just give a brief background and introduction for Demetria. So as I said, she currently serves as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity at the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, for FAGO, uh, McCain assists HUD's efforts with uh, to eliminate housing discrimination, promote economic opportunity, and achieve diverse, inclusive communities. She joins HUD following 15 years of service with five as president at the Inclusive Communities Project, a Dallas, Texas-based affordable fair housing nonprofit. Prior to becoming president, she oversaw operations, communications, and uh, ICP's Mobility Assistance Program, a housing mobility program that helps housing choice voucher holders exercise their fair housing rights. Conceived by Demetria, uh, ICP's Voices for Opportunity initiative has provided advocacy training to low-income renters and neighborhood groups of color. Before joining ICP, uh, she worked on USDA Section 515 Rural Multifamily Housing Matters at the National Housing Law. She also was a staff attorney for the Neighborhood Legal Services Program of Washington, D.C., assigned to the Southeast office, where her portfolio primarily included landlord-tenant matters for low-income renters in private and public housing. She is taught as an adjunct instructor, a fair housing and homelessness course to undergraduate uh, Copen State University students. She brings dual vantage points to uh, FAGO after having spent years assisting both housing choice voucher holders who sought low poverty, well-resourced housing options and neighborhood groups in underserved communities of color who sought more equitable distribution of resources and services. She has sat on several local and national nonprofit boards and is a sought after panelist and commentator on affordable fair housing and the impacts of residential segregation. She is a graduate of Howard University School of Law, New York University, and Brooklyn College, and a member of the Dallas Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. Um, and so with that, I would like to turn it over to uh, Demetria for some remarks. Thank you so much, Kellen. Thank you, entire branch, Arlington, Virginia branch of NAACP. I really, really, really appreciate um, this opportunity. And I usually do lots of speaking engagements during Fair Housing Month, but I got to tell you, you are the first for 2024. So uh, it's an honor to be here virtually, though. <laughs> right. So thank you. Um, and let me just say that speaking of Fair Housing Month, it was 56 years ago when um, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, moved his, uh, was assassinated. And that came after he had moved his family to all the way across the country. Um, all the way to Chicago. They actually lived in Chicago so that they had an opportunity to experience some of the fair housing problems that advocates there were going through. And as folks, some of these, some of you folks might know this. I'm not sure everyone knows this though, but it was just seven days after his assassination that the Fair Housing Act became law. Um, that kind of motivated um, Congress and the president to get it done. It had been lingering for quite some time. 
So I'll say in doing so, um, this law really kind of moved our country to address the entrenched discrimination that was existing in the housing market at the time. And, and, and I always want to make sure that people understand that the Fair Housing Act pro prohibits things based on seven protected classes, right? Um, and those that people don't always know all of them because some of them are, are less known, but they include race, color, national origin, sex, including gender identity and sexual orientation, religion, disability, and familial status. And when I say familial status, that has to do with people under the age of 18 being in the household, be that somebody who is uh, pregnant or about to become a parent, uh, fostering, what have you. Um, and, and let me just also say that this civil rights law truly has impacted millions of people since 1968. But despite this law, folks, as many of you know, not everyone has escaped the actual pains that housing discrimination creates. And in addition to that, there's a part of the Fair Housing Act that is often forgotten. People don't really know about it. It's called the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Mandate. It's a mouthful, and some of us refer to it as AFFH. That's in there. It's been in there since 1968, part of that statute since 1968. It has remained law ever since. What the heck does that mean? Well, let me just say that it requires the, the administration of HUD programs and activities to be carried out in a manner that affirmatively furthers the policies of the Fair Housing Act, right? So to affirmably further fair housing, that's more than simply sitting back saying, hey, I don't discriminate, right? That's really kind of more passive, right? So that word affirmative is in there intentionally. And so I want to say that last year, HUD published a draft rule, actually, and that was entitled Affirmably Furthering Fair Housing. And when we published that draft rule, we actually sought comments from the entire public to see what they thought about that draft rule. Now that proposed rule, once finalized, would implement the Fair Housing Act statutory mandate to affirmatively further fair housing, that requiring agencies and program participants like states, counties, certain municipalities, public housing agencies to proactively take meaningful action to eliminate disparities and opportunity, to foster inclusive communities that are free from discrimination, to overcome patterns of, of segregation. That's what we put in that proposed rule. And so as we finalize that draft rule, let me say that we are anticipating publishing that in the coming weeks. I know that's a big question we have from lots of folks. So I just wanna go ahead and put that out there that we're hoping that that gets finalized and published in the coming weeks. So I strongly encourage you to join the HUD listserv so that you can hear about it when it is made final. And if you want to join that, that listserv, just go to hud.gov and you'll figure out how to sign up to get our press releases in that way. You can hear about it. And so let me just say that we know there's a lot much more to do, folks, as far as discrimination goes, you know, to not only to undo the systemic discrimination that, that was created in the 20th century that actually continues to plague us now, um, which actually was referenced in President Biden's January 2021 memo to HUD, but we know that we've got to address the perpetuating harms from that systemic discrimination and address the new harms that continue to burden individuals, communities, and really our entire nation. So there's a whole lot of work to do. And so I certainly look forward to, to making sure that these policies are actually implemented um, and, and benefit everybody and benefit our whole country. But let me just share this as well. Let me share that my office, FHEO, Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity Office, FHEO works with our state and local partners through a couple of programs that we have. We have a program called the Fair Housing Initiatives Program, and then we have a program called the Fair Housing Assistance Program. And everyone should know that these fair housing partners of ours are, are hugely important to us. And so when it comes to the Fair Housing Initiatives Program, and we call that FIP, um, in Virginia, you guys have housing opportunities made equal of Virginia. Um, sometimes they call themselves home of Virginia, and that's that's a big partner of ours. Um, also, 
as far as other agencies that take fair housing um, uh, cases that we refer to them, those are our FAPs, right? Our fair housing assistance programs. And so you've got your state fair housing agency, and you also have there the Fairfax Human Rights Commission in Virginia as well. And so HUD and HUD partners actually receive and address complaints day in and day out. I just want to give you a flavor, and this is just a minute flavor of the type of complaints that come into our offices. One, let's say, for instance, reasonable accommodation requests by someone who has a disability. Those kind of reasonable accommodation requests that have been ignored by property management and owners, causing people with disabilities to actually live huma inhumanely, right? Uh, to complaints like a landlord denied rental to a young black woman because of her race and then placing the discriminatory ads, right, um, online and then making discriminatory statements to this person and then later retaliating against her when she was trying to affect her fair housing rights. That's another type. And then there is the type where we've got an owner discriminating against a tenant based on sex while while that person uh, is being prohibited from self-expression, right? A uh, transgender tenant being told to dress like a man, talk like a man, act like a man. And then we have things that affect lots of people, those types of complaints. Multiple entities and individuals who actually perpetuated a scheme to deceive distressed homeowners of Caribbean descent into forfeiting their titles to their homes. Now, folks, you know how hard it is to get to buy a home, right? And so to get somebody to trick you into forfeiting title to your home, can you imagine how hurtful that is? And let me just say, while this just really minute snapshot of the type of cases we take, let me just say that there are a lot of cases that simply don't go reported at all. And I would say, for instance, we've got cases based on religion, right? That's our lowest category when we look at the numbers every year. But we all know, right? that hate is taking place around the country like crazy as it relates to re religion. Now, disability and race are our biggest categories of cases that we see. But let me just say that uh, religion remains a protected class, which is why this last year, in coordination with the White House's federal interagency effort to combat anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, my office issued a memorandum entitled, Ensuring Fair Housing Act, amidst ongoing religious discrimination in the United States. Sent that over to our staff, sent it over to our FIP partners, our FAP partners, just reminding everyone to keep a watchful eye out for housing discrimination based on religion. And let me just say, just last month, we issued a resource entitled Tenant Background Checks and Your Rights. That was actually released jointly with the Department of Justice, Federal Trade Commission, Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, and us, right? We also released uh, another uh, item on our website for the public's consumption. It's called No Good Cause for Discrimination. Some evictions are never allowed. Because people, believe it or not, um, have been facing evictions left and right. And sometimes if they're based on violations to the Fair Housing Act, of course, those evictions are not allowed. So we wanted to make sure people understood that. And I could go on and on and on, and on about some of our act activities we do in this regard, but I hope that that gives you a sense of some of the things that we handle. Um, and I just want to know that, want you to know that with the policies we're trying to enact under this administration, please know, please know that HUD cares. Please know. And so with that, Cullen, I'm I'm happy to uh, entertain any in, any type of dialogue you'd like for us to engage in. Thank you so much for Demetria. I, there's there's a lot that you said that um, I I do want to touch on, and and I have some questions about and. I know I'm very excited about the affirmatively further for housing uh, final rule. Um, as you said, that's said to come out in a few weeks um, and the work that the administration has been doing to, to move that forward um, and make sure that uh, HUD recipients of funds um, are proactively engaging um, and making their communities more equitable, um, getting rid of segregation that's been in place for, for decades and in some cases getting worse. Um, so I, I want to touch on that, but first, um, I wanted to ask you, uh, kind of a broader question. Um, and I know this, this could be a little bit challenging to answer, but what are, in your view, the most pressing fair housing issues impacting the United States today? Well, um, uh, well, Helen, let me just say that I'm not here to talk about my personal view. <laughs> 
right? Um, but let me just say that uh, my personal view, quite quite frankly, uh, 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 isn't aligned with the uh, view of the administration. And I think that we can really kind of understand some of the most pressing issues. Sometimes those are really, you asked about the nation, but sometimes those are very local. And so I would first say that it's important to maybe stay connected to your, your FIP, for instance, to see, uh, get a sense of what's going on locally. But I think that we can understand some of the pressing issues based on the Biden-Harris administration's priorities through their executive orders, right, and, and public statements. For instance, we had the uh, president's uh, executive order on racial equity. Not only was that released in 2021, but there's also was redone a second version of that in 2023. So when you ask about priorities and issues facing us, the nation, um, the fact that we had even a second executive order on racial equity uh, which includes not just housing, but other issues as well. I think that gives you a sense that, as I mentioned earlier, there are systemic things that, that have not been undone just yet. And so that's that's really critical. I think also we've got um, an executive order on climate and environmental justice. Um, we issue, we, we settled a case um, last year, an environmental justice case under our, 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 our Title VI authority, because we don't just have authority under the Fair Housing Act. We also have Authority under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, we settled a case with the city of Chicago as it relates to environmental justice. So that's still important, right? That's still pressing. It's not happening everywhere. I don't know that it's happening in Virginia per se, right? Um, so that's why it's really important to get local. But from a national perspective, these executive orders don't just come out of nowhere, right? They come out of the, they're informed by real people on the ground, people with lived expertise, um, policymakers, data, research. Um, another priority, both of uh, the Biden-Harris administration and of HUD, is issues as relates to second chances and those folks who are returning citizens to our communities, right? Um, they've served their time, and now it's time for them to serve and make themselves good, great, great citizens who are able to contribute, right? And so second chances are hugely important because um, we know that there are a lot of people who have struggles getting housing, once they are re-entering. Um, issues as it relates to the LGBTQI plus community. Um, the president issued an executive order after the US Supreme Court Bostock decision. Also um, issued a second executive order as it relates to young people and youth who are part of this community. So those are some of the pressing issues I would say that are taking place right now. Thank you very much for that. Um, you had previously talked about uh, the administration's efforts around AFFH. And as you said, this has long been a part of the Fair Housing Act, um, but it was essentially overlooked for, for many decades. And it was uh, not something that was, a, I would say, a primary focus for the federal government and, and certainly not for a lot of uh, localities and, and states across the country. Um, and since the NAACP Arlington branch, we're very much focused on you know, what we can do to make our community better. What are some things that localities like Arlington um, should be aware of and, and be thinking about when it comes to understanding um, AFFH rulemaking and, and kind of what, what that means for a community like Arlington or other you know, similarly situated um, counties or cities across the country? Yeah, well, the rulemaking process can be a little tricky um, and maybe a little difficult to understand sometimes. So thank you for the question. If you could just give me a little latitude here, I like to kind of flesh out kind of where we've been the last couple of years as it relates to this um, so folks can understand. So, so as I mentioned earlier, and as Kellen just kind of reiterated, this has been law since 1968, but the implementation of that has not been as robust as, as, it, as it could be. Right, and so under the Obama administration, there was an affirmatively furthering for housing rule that came out. Um, administrations changed, and then that rule was uh, uh, put on the back burner, for lack of a better word. Um, but when the Biden Harris administration came back, what they did was they they took that they took the time to issue an interim final rule, right, interim, and they did that immediately back in 2021, and in doing so, they actually restored the implementation of the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing requirement, right? And so what does that mean? That means that HUD program participants, let's say grantees of funds from HUD, public housing agencies who are in 
in, in, in contract with HUD, they actually, when they're taking funding from us, they need to certify that they are affirmatively furthering for housing. And so that certification piece was brought back in 2021 and it exists today, even though we're still waiting for a final rule of this new version. And that new version builds upon the 2015 version. And so that's that's important for people to know that that requirement exists now. Now, also, let me just say that that interim final rule, like I said, interim while we're waiting for this final one to come out, that interim final rule actually provides some robust definitions of what it means to affirmably fair their fair housing, right? So when they're certifying, they know what they're certifying too, because they've got a robust definition there. And so that's important to understand. And so since the interim final rule, we actually have um, invited and have seen um, jurisdictions and, and program participants voluntarily engage in the fair housing planning process without waiting for the final rule, right? So our office actually has helped folks. Uh, we've provided technical assistance. We told people when we issued the interim final rule, we'll help you with the voluntary process if you want to get started on some fair housing planning activities. And so that's what we've done and that's what we've been doing alongside writing the draft rule, getting public comments on the draft rule, and now finalizing that final rule. And so going back to your first question, I would say part of that technical assistance that we issued for folks who were going through this voluntary process included what we call a fair housing planning toolkit. I cannot say enough about our staff who put this toolkit together. Our staff, FHEO staff, as well as our Office of General Counsel worked together to put together this fair housing planning toolkit for folks like you all, for communities, for grantees, for public housing agencies. And let me just say that this fair housing planning toolkit, and, and I'll try to send you the link, Kellen, so you can share it with everybody. It has eight modules, okay? And each of those eight modules have their own set of objectives for people to read and understand. Kellen, if I have time, I like to kind of go through this list of the modules, if that's okay, so people have a sense of what's in there. Yes, that, that works. Okay, so um, so there's module one is the Fair Housing Act, background on fair, house, for fair housing planning, right? Um, module two is preparing for fair housing planning and data analysis. Module three is analyzing programs, policies, practices, and procedures for a fair housing plan. And then one that, that may be of particular interest to this audience, module four, right, is all about community participation in fair housing planning. And to give you a sense of the objectives under that particular module, one is learn who needs to be engaged in fair housing planning from the community, right? That's critical. There are parts of communities that people don't always think about, but everybody should be engaged. Um, another objective under the community participation piece is learn what are the best practices for community participation. That's in there, that's in our planning, fair housing planning toolkit. And also under module four, one of the objectives is learn how to reach protective class populations and organize and organizations that actually advocate for those types of uh, uh, protected classes. So remember I mentioned earlier the seven protected classes. And so it's important to include all seven of those protected classes when doing the outreach, right? And let me just, if I could take a moment of, of, of personal privilege here, I always like to stress that things are intersectional, right? People could be discriminated against based on their race, for sure. But people could also be discriminated against based on the fact that they have a disability. And perhaps they're being discriminated against based on both, or national origin, or the fact that they have kids, right? And so as we think about the community outreach piece, I think it's important to think about how people may be members or parts of or of several of these protected class groups that are often or historically, let's say, marginalized. And so that tech took me up to module four. Um, let me just go through the next four modules if I could. Now, module five in the toolkit is how to conduct fair housing planning data analysis. Module six is how to create the fair housing plan, right? And seven is how to set fair housing goals and ensure meaningful actions to affirmably further fair housing. 
And last and final module is the ultimate, right? Is implementing the fair housing plan, right? And, and so before we had had the 2015 version of affordably fairly fair housing, before we had our interim final rule, there were analysis of fair housing impediments that existed, right? But too often they just sit on the shelves and collected dust. And so implementing the actual fair housing plan, how to transform fair housing goals into action, that's module eight. And like I said, each one of these modules have objectives to them um, to help walk the reader through um, some of the suggestions on how to get there. And I think that this has been uh, has been a tool that people have used. Um, it's fairly new though. And understand that once we do have a final rule, um, this toolkit will be updated to reflect uh, whatever is ultimately in that final AFFH rule. So I know that's a long-winded way to get to your question, Kellen, but I think it was really important because uh, a lot of work has been put into this resource in order to help folks like you all. No, it's very much appreciated. I know Arlington County joined a lot of its neighbors um, in Northern Virginia, D.C., and Maryland over the last couple of years uh, through the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments to develop the regional fair housing plan and then specific goals uh, for each locality. And um, the NAACP was able to be a part of that process and the advisory committee they put together as well as some of the, the engagement and outreach that they did. Um, and you know, kudos to, to HUD for the technical assistance as part of that effort. Um, as well as all the people from the, the local governments and from uh, from COG who were involved. because so I think we ended up with the most ambitious fair housing plan that we've ever seen um, for the region and, and definitely for Arlington County. Um, and I think from the NAACP's perspective, we're really excited about the implementation steps now that that was adopted last year, um, how we can work with our local government and with the region to ensure that we're staying true to the, the promises that have been made. Um, and that we're really moving towards incorporating equity into how we're doing housing policy programs um, and stepping up things like housing enforce or fair housing enforcement, um, education and outreach when it comes to that. Um, and so that kind of goes into to my next question for you then, um, which is what are some of the things that local governments can do to fight housing and discrimination within their communities? Well, I would say, well, first of all, let me just say, well, kudos for you joining the regional planning process. And I have been reading about that um, various places. Um, but since you're at the implementation stage, I will share the objectives for that last uh, module, module eight on implementation. So there are three objectives under that one. And that is learn when to incorporate the fair housing goals into subsequent planning processes, right? Because most likely there will be other planning processes that will take place. Uh, along the lines, either from the housing agency perspective, from the county perspective, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so another objective there is also learn how to maintain records, right, of the types of actions and activities that have taken place. Um, and also learn when to evaluate and revise, right? Because sometimes there are plans that exist, but things happen, right? And sometimes there are revisions that that might be called for. So just highlighting that for you. And so I'm sorry, Colin, go ahead and re restate that question for me again regarding- Yeah, that. so the question is, what are some of the things that local governments can do to fight housing discrimination in their communities? Yeah, I would say um, it's really important. I mean, these resources that we provide, both the FIP, the Home of Virginia, and the resources we provide, the FAPS, right, through, through your state, Fairfax County, um, that's that's in order to benefit the community. So I would say it'd be really important um, to connect there, um, to make sure that you are in conversation with, with those entities, because um, everything's very local. And so uh, from sitting from a national federal perspective, it's not for us to say what's going on in detail locally, but I think that connecting with those types of entities and those types of folks would be hugely important. Going back to look at that plan, what did we say? What were the facts that informed that plan? Are those facts still the same? That's what I would say to that. Thank you. One of the things that you touched on when you talked about the eight modules was sort of the data collection and analysis around um, developing like a, a fair housing plan. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what 
localities can do, and maybe that's through through that process to better understand what housing discrimination is happening in their communities, whether that's appraisal bias or you know lending discrimination or as you know you brought up in your opening remarks about landlords discriminating against tenants based on you know sexual uh, orientation or gender identity or um, their races, as we know, we've seen cases in Arlington County of landlords um, refusing to rent to someone because they they didn't like their country of origin and and their race. Um, so what what can localities do to better understand what's happening in their community when it comes to um, who's facing discrimination and and at what scale? Yeah, well, I think I mean it's it's. I don't. I can't speak specifically to Arlington, Virginia, but I will say that some some organizations I know put out like annual reports, or what have you, about what's going on or what they've seen. And when I said earlier about connecting with your FIP, I think that's important. Let me just give you an example, because from a federal perspective, let me just say I named seven protected classes, right? And those are, are are things that based on complaints that we've received, okay? But also retaliation. I mentioned retaliation when the young lady was retaliated against once she tried to affect her fair housing rights. So let me just share that we have federal statistics, and they can break. You could if you connect with your FIP and your FAPS, you can figure out the local statistics of what people are seeing. And so from a federal perspective, we know that in fiscal twenty three we had 5,090 disability cases that we handled nationally, right? Along with our FIPS. 2,142 were race cases, race-based cases, right? Retaliation, we had just over 1,000. Those based on sex, we had about 950. Those based on national origin, we saw about 695. Um, when it comes to familial status, those folks with kids, we saw about close to 700. Um, based on color, about 320, and based on religion, about 185, and that totals is just over 8,000. Now, again, remember intersectionality, so some people file under more than one. And so to the extent that we know this from a national perspective, you can get that, you know, uh, if you work with your FIP and look at your FAPS and ask them what, what, what are the bases that they're seeing? But understand this though, Kellen, and this is where the community is really important. Everybody with a fair housing problem doesn't file a fair housing complaint, right? And so if you take it upon yourselves to connect with those entities, and maybe perhaps I've seen people do certain types of surveys, et cetera, et cetera, to get a sense of what's on people's minds and what kind of troubles they're experiencing. Thank you so much for that. I, I think that's something that we see in Arlington as well, from talking to especially low income residents um, who in describing issues that they're facing um, with their landlords or property managers, they're they're describing housing discrimination, um, but they don't connect the dots that that's what it is. And also many of them don't understand the process to file a claim. Um, yeah, and, and let me just step in there and say that um, our uh, FIP certainly has education outreach activities that they do, but our office here at headquarters, we have an education outreach team who can connect with you all if you'd like um, and see, because you guys are very close to us, you're not far from DC, to see if you have some kind of event or something, perhaps our education outreach team could provide some help and with passing out pamphlets and things of that nature um, so that people do know their rights, they do know what phone number or, email or website I say email address, what website they can go to to file a complaint because the education and outreach piece is, is hugely important. But because we know when people are stressed and in a crisis, they may not necessarily take the time to file a complaint because guess what? If they didn't get this housing to rent, they got to hurry up and find someplace else to rent, right? And that doesn't always leave time when you are dealing with your kids who've got to go to school, you got to go to work, maybe you have two jobs. But if we can help with anything related to education outreach, just please contact our office. Thank you very much. Yeah, definitely will take you up on that offer. I think as many resources as we can bring to bear to ensure that people understand what their rights are um, and and when they faced illegal discrimination and what to do about it, uh, we're more than happy to, to do whatever we can to make that available to the community and the people who and, need it. And certainly we know the long, amazing history of NAACP branches who themselves have, have uh, stepped up and file complaints based on what's going on, right? 
Um, and so sometimes it may take an organization to sit back and see that there's a pattern or something going. I'm not saying that that's happening in Arlington, Virginia, but there are very known cases brought by NAACP branches. Mm -hmm. Um, my next question uh, is it, it kind of also traces back to, to one of the modules that, that you talked about with the fair housing or AFFH planning. Um, and so this is around uh, historically marginalized populations. What, what can policymakers do to better engage with historically marginalized populations when making housing policy or planning decisions in their communities? Yeah, so I'm not sure what level of policymakers you're talking about, but I'll tell you what we're doing as policymakers here at HUD. Um, and, and it started with uh, former Secretary Marsha Fudge. She made it clear to us that she wanted us to connect with people with lived expertise, right? Because uh, to sit like kind of like in this vacuum and make policy that doesn't really connect with people is not the best way to go. We've seen that in the past, right? And so every day here, we are doing listening sessions, whether they be in person as we fly around the country, as I fly around the country and my colleagues fly around the country, talking to people. Uh, Secretary used to fly around the country like talking a lot talking to people. We've invited groups into our office in person um, to talk to them. So whether it be in person are virtual, um, listening to people with lived experience is hugely important. I just recently came back from uh, Boston uh, where I connected with some folks who are returning to society, hearing the experiences that they have gone through, uh, heart-wrenching, I must say, but certainly things that you have to stop and think, hmm, is there a policy fix there um, to address this? So I think making sure that there's that type of outreach right? Knowing where to go is the first thing, right? Of where those marginalized populations are. And that Fair Housing Planning Toolkit really kind of touched upon it earlier, really kind of uh, shares how important it is to touch people of all of those protected classes. Um, also, we have an Office of Public Engagement, which sits within our Office of Public Affairs, and their job is specifically to deal with public engagement. Um, and so I think that that's hugely important, is getting on the ground, talking to people with the lived experiences. Definitely agree um, that that engaging folks who have the lived experiences is, is one of the best ways to, to help shape and formulate these policies and, and also review what's in place currently. Um, and I know that um, during the regional fair housing planning efforts, it was, it was really wonderful to see the focus groups that were happening and the outreach that that took place to to engage with communities who um, either were, you know, historically marginalized or, you know, we know are current targets of discrimination are facing that. Um, and I think we got some really good data from that. Uh, sometimes it's it's tougher to do that separately from a big regional planning effort um, when we're just looking at local policies and programs. But it's something that at the NAACP, we keep pushing to local policymakers that it's so incredibly important um, to, to engage with the folks who aren't necessarily going to just show up at a board meeting or show up at a commission meeting and, and voice their opinion because, you know, they have free time and they're trying to figure out right, right, right. how best to spend it. Um, so that that's something that I know is really important to us. And we've been trying to communicate to our local policymakers that it's, it's so important, even if it means more time and more money gets spent on the engagement efforts to to connect with those folks who are harder to reach, but the ones who are really uh, facing the most issues when it comes to whether it's affordable housing or fair housing. Um, so I, that definitely resonates. Well, I, and I would say, I mean, it's not a matter of trust, right? Like, why would they want to come? Why do they want to mm -hmm. hear you? You know, so what are you offering? What is the setting in which you're doing that listening session, right? What is the time of day you're doing that listening session? Who is the moderator of that listening session, right? Is that somebody who can connect with, with the group that you're trying to reach? So all that comes into play. And sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't, and, and sometimes people are probably wondering, are you just gonna like, fly in and we're never gonna see you again, right? So perhaps is there a listening session that happens on a quarterly basis so that that trust can be built in over time? Oh, excuse me. No, thank you. Uh, those are all very helpful. Um, helpful things that we're happy to take back to, to Arlington County um, and, and see what we can do to, to better engage with uh, historically marginalized populations. 
Um, my next question, and I know you talked about it again when uh, or in your opening remarks, um, and something that is a pretty protracted issue in the United States, and that's segregation. Um, and it's something that I, I feel like, especially local communities, really struggle with how do we move forward with eliminating segregation in our neighborhoods and communities. In Arlington County, which is a very affluent community, um, we have gaps in life expectancy by up to 10 years uh, in neighborhoods that are right next to each other um, and often associated with um, differences in race and ethnicity uh, in those neighborhoods. And the health outcomes um, are can be quite different. Uh, same thing, you look at employment rates. Um, so what, what can communities do uh, to to move forward with ending segregation in our neighborhoods and and what efforts what is HUD providing as support um, on a national level to help move forward with ending segregation? Yeah, well, um, that's that's there's a there's a lot to that question, right? Because if we had all the answers, then we wouldn't have that problem right now. But I think first we first we lead with the word choice, right? Um, where people want to live, right? Because there are groups of people, particularly black and brown people who have been steered and told where they must live, particularly when that relates to the income levels that they have. And we know that uh, uh, just like you were saying, there are different, there's, there are dis there's disparate numbers when it comes to health outcomes, there are disparate numbers when it comes to income, right? Um, and so uh, there are lots of tools different communities are trying to use. Um, and it just depends on what's going on locally. Uh, of course, ridding ourselves of segregation is part of the Fair Housing Act, right? And so to the extent that we do have a final rule that will be coming forth uh, for folks who are going through that process, we will have technical assistance to help folks, but there are a number of national nonprofit ad advocacy fair housing groups that, that are working on these types of issues as well. It's not my place, you know, as I sit here at HUD, to uh, kind of list them out or sell them to anybody, right? Um, but they're different tools that 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 various folks are using, um, and I think that if you look at the fair housing toolkit, that might be helpful. Um, yeah, that's what I would say on that. But there's lots of things as it relates to anything from, you know, your your housing stock. Where's your housing stock? Are there different income levels to different housing stocks and based on where they're located and based on types of housing stock. And, and there could be some policy issues behind uh, the answers to some of those questions, but it's not mine to say that's very local. And we like to make sure, you know, from a HUD perspective, that local folks are able to look at their local, local problems and use their local tools um, to address those problems. But there are groups out there who, who help with those types of things. Thank you. My next question um, is around environmental justice. And so HUD, you know, recently has been um, putting more of a focus on environmental justice. Um, can you talk about the intersection with fair housing um, and kind of what that looks like uh, from, from HUD's perspective? Sure. I, well, the best way to describe it is based on the, um, the conciliation that we talked about, that I talked about a little earlier. Um, as I mentioned before too, though, the uh, administration has the executive order on climate and environmental justice. Uh, so that's been something that's kind of been told to all the agencies that we need to pay attention to. Um, when it comes to environmental justice, I gotta say, I'm very proud of our staff. It, this conciliation that I'm about to tell you about really was the first of its kind in any recent history of memory that has come out of HUD. Um, the bottom line is the city, uh, there was a, a, a factory, so to say, for lack of a better word, uh, in a majority white neighborhood that was being moved over to a majority black and brown neighborhood um, because the neighbors uh, had complained about it. And so with the city's blessings, for lack of a better word, it was going to be moved over to this black and brown neighborhood that already had several other um, industrial types of activities taking place in it. And so from a local perspective, uh, preachers, churches, community members um, fought back against the city. They eventually um, made a lot of noise. They filed a complaint with HUD. Um, we took up the complaint. It was not under the, it was not so much under the Fair Housing Act, 
as it was under Title VI. And so it's important to understand Title VI as well. As a matter of fact, this year is the 60th anniversary of Title VI because it was adopted in 1964. Title VI um, speaks to federal en entities that receive federal funding as it relates to racial and national origin discrimination. And so our team took a good period of time doing quite a bit of research, looking um, at maps, looking at what's where, looking at the kind of the history uh, that had, that uh, those decisions had gone through. And we're quite pleased that the city came to the table and uh, negotiated and we were able to get to uh, a type of uh, agreement. Um, and so there is a, a really, I think, good robust uh, relief out of that agreement, which includes steps that the city needs to take before they make those types of decisions again, right? Engaging the community, right? Um, looking at the partic partic uh, in particular for health outcomes or health impacts of that type of move or that type of factory. So um, we're really proud of that. Um, that is on our website. If you go to, F if you Google FHEO press releases, um, you'll find uh, a description of more detail on our website, but we're really, really proud. I can't be more proud of our staff that, uh, who worked on that. Thank you so much uh, for talking more about that. And I think the incorporating environmental justice in a lot of the different policy areas that as a NAACP chapter, you know, we work on is incredibly important, and especially housing, um, making sure that um, those are that are interconnected as we pursue policy solutions. It's it's very important. And like I said, that, like the complaint came from the community. So it's what people in the community are saying and seeing. Um, my next question uh, goes back to sort of the AFFH um, and the oversight that HUD provides when it comes to implementation. So I know you talked about that there's an implementation module. Um, what is what is HUD's role after the plan has been submitted and approved? Um, and I, I, I don't know if this is getting too far ahead of the final rule or anything. And, and please, you know, uh, answer the way that you, you need to answer, um, given what's public uh, and what is still pending. But um, what what role does HUD have after a plan has been approved and and the local government or communities in the implementation stage to make sure that um, it is moving forward based off of the goals and the strategies that had been, um, you know, agreed to. And you're absolutely right. We just kind of have to all wait and see. That's a nail biter. So we'll wait and see until that final rule is published. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Good I'm, try, Colin. Good try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> e for effort. <laughs> um, so uh, it looks like we had a question in the chat. Um, uh, from someone who is asking about, uh, first, thanking you for your leadership at HUD, um, but they also, they said you didn't mention where the environmental justice example was. Um, oh, Chicago, city of Chicago. Okay. Yep. Go. Uh, what a small so, city. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no stranger to fair housing uh, <laughs> issues and, and case studies written about things that have happened in, in Chicago um, that now impact a lot of the rest of the United States. Um, are there, are there other things? I know we just have a couple minutes left. Um, other things that we haven't touched on thus far that you think are particularly important in light of fair housing month or things that you just want to reemphasize, um, for, especially, you know, we have a mix of some policymakers who are in this meeting yes, um, some staff and advocates. Well, I really appreciate that question because like I said earlier, I could go on and on and on, but I just want to let people know and I'll flag for people a couple of things. In addition to looking for that final rule to come out of HUD, you should also be looking for um, uh, Section 504 uh, of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 relates to disabilities. Um, the regulations for that have not in any significant way been updated since 1980. Now, that doesn't seem very far for an old person like me. <laughs> well, a long time ago. And so we're looking at getting out uh, some rules uh, regarding that. And like I said, I know you guys are the NAACP um, and probably focus a lot on race, probably perhaps income. But let me tell you something. When we look at the statistics of people 
who are having to struggle with their disabilities, we know things are intersectional. And so I can't stress enough how I think it's really important for people of all communities to pay attention to some of these disability issues. Um, and so that'll be coming out. Um, also, also, you should be looking out for an NPRM where we'll be seeking public comment as it relates to, not from my office, but from our public housing and multifamily offices, we'll be issuing a draft rule as it relates to really second chance reentry. Um, so I think that might be something of interest to to, to your folks and your your your, your branch. Um, that should be coming out sometime soon too. So folks, really, I would say sign up for HUD's press releases on our listserv so that you can get that information. And and we want to hear from people with lived expertise. And so since you are an organization, right, you can reach housing providers. We want to hear from everybody. You can reach people who may have family members, right, who have re-entered. You may pe reach people who, who are re-entering themselves and struggling with some issues. So we really want to hear from all corners of the universe um, as it relates to to these both both sets of things that will be coming out. So please, please, please watch for that. Thank you for that. Um, and, and related to the reentry um, policy, is that is that also related to the I think it was 2015 or 2016 um, memo from HUD around how uh, fair housing laws would apply to um, uh, to tenants with felony or other, you know, criminal history. So, um, I think what you're referencing, Kellen, is the 2016 Office of General Counsel guidance yes. as to the way criminal convictions, past criminal convictions, are treated um, as it relates to the Fair Housing Act. So, actually, that policy still exists. It's still important. Matter of fact, in June 2022. I kind of uh, amplified that to let people know that, that that's really important right now. But essentially, sec our former Secretary Fudge sent a memo to HUD uh, a couple of Februarys ago and told every office at HUD to look at all of our policies as it relates to second chances, right? And so that's what this coming rule is about. Okay. Uh, personally, I issued a uh, 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 a, a, a new rule that came that was published today, actually <laughs> published today, as it relates to an FHEO set of policies regarding who our FIPS and FAPS could hire when they're looking for undercover testers to do uh, fair housing testing, um, and so that's what our office issued just just today, and so this draft rule. Uh, is coming out of PIH, Public and Indian Housing Office, and Multifamily Office, as it relates to their programs and who can be qualified, who should, I don't want to get into the draft rule because it hasn't been published yet, but that's kind of what the secretary told all of our offices to look at. What kind of things are creating unnecessary barriers for folks to access HUD programs? Okay. Um... That's super helpful. I think one final question um, before uh, before we wrap up, and that's just a question from the chat: is what can we do to grow the coalition supporting fair housing? Um, and obviously, it has such a significant impact. Um, poor conditions or discrimination on a lot of people's lives. Um, any any thoughts or you know recommendations on what we can do to grow the coalition of people who? Who are caring about this issue and and you know willing to put time and energy into making sure that um, we do more when it comes to affirmatively furthering fair housing and implementing it. Well, Kellen, I'm going to say you guys are the experts. I would look to you, right? And so I would say talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. Think about this. Think about when we first had Obamacare. Every nonprofit, every church, everybody in the world was talking about health care, right? And so could we do that as it relates to fair housing issues, right? Housing, housing is huge. Housing actually has has grown part of people's conversations since, since the pandemic, honestly, right? And I'll, I'll be honest, my personal view is that because more people than usual were touched by housing issues. And so I think now is a time to grab hold of this moment and talk about housing. If you're talking about housing, then you're necessarily also talking about fair housing issues. So I look to you all as the experts for that. Thank you, we we try. Uh, and we're always <laughs> looking to, to grow our membership for the NAACP. 
Um, and so for anyone who lives in Arlington uh, and is not a member of the NAACP, we welcome you to, to sign up um, and become members. Um, so I, I just, I wanted to, to, you know, first of all, thank you very much, Demetria, for your time today and your remarks. This was very informative um, and it's gotten me even more excited about fair housing. Um, and uh, I, I wanna give a plug for um, the third annual Arlington Fair Housing Conference, which will be on Saturday, April 20th from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the HB Woodlawn School Building in Roslyn. Um, and I will put the sign up for that um, in the chat. Um, and I also wanted to uh, give a plug for the upcoming uh, school board uh, candidate forum on April 15th at 6.30 that the NAACP Arlington branch is also hosting. Um, and I just wanted to lastly thank our elected officials who were in attendance, uh, Matt DeFranti and Susan Cunningham from the Arlington County Board. And apologies if I missed anyone else um, who was attending, who was then elected. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Demetria, and thank you to everyone who attended. Um, I'm and trying to put a couple of links here in your chat before. Okay. All right. Sounds good. We'll we'll try to send it out to the people who signed up um, okay. for it as well. So yeah, thank you and.